Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker is good and occasionally triumphant. And I know half of you already disagree with me vehemently, but all I'm asking before we start is that you consider the possibility that a movie you loathe still has some strengths we can all learn from. The focus of the controversy around this piece of cinema has to do with how it challenges the legacy of its own franchise. When it comes to the Disney era of Star Wars, The Force Awakens gave us, the audience, what we wanted. Chewie, we're home. The Last Jedi challenged what we wanted. No, no, you're still holding on! Let go! And this final chapter asks us if we've been given what we needed. Some things are stronger than blood. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. And just like Star Wars entering the modern arena, what we all need is identity. Today I want to look at this masterpiece of a trilogy and dissect in detail the dramatic bedrock upon which all of its themes are built. You can still hate what the stories choose to say, but you cannot deny the expertise in delivery of the lesson. First, we have to discover whether or not your story needs to be very clear with what the conflict is and why it matters. I think it's advantageous to discuss this in regard to The Rise of Skywalker because this film has three distinct character journeys, and each of them answer the claims posed by the foundation of storytelling while being surrounded by satellite characters, supporting that thematic nuance. So let's begin with part one, Wants versus Needs. The first question of identity is what a character wants versus what they need, and how do these wants and needs conflict with each other in the character. Wants and needs are pretty well established ideas in storytelling. Both of these books lean heavily on these ideas, though King calls wants the mind, while Truby calls the needs the soul. But it's the same thing. Basically, a character is an expletive representation of conflicting wants and needs. You just can't be too obvious with them, or you'll end up with a bad screenplay. So what's the difference between the mind and the soul in storytelling? The mind is primal, mammalian, an organ dependent and despondent through decades of decadence. Minds relate to like power, money, status. As Truby postulates, a character will begin their journey relentlessly pursuing their mind's desire. However, this inevitably leads to dissatisfaction due to the want in some way being immoral or misguided. It's not the thing they actually need to solve their problems. Needs are, according to King, the soul, what the hero must fulfill within the self in order to have a superior existence. When a character does what they need to do, we can see what the lesson, theme, and moral of the story is. Let's start with Rey, since her arc is the most overt. Rey wants to discover her identity at any cost to the world around her. She's reckless and unfocused when we meet her. I'm never touching that thing again. I don't want any part of this. <clears throat> this is dramatized by The Last Jedi when she is brought to her second act low point of the trilogy by the posthumous villain Kylo Ren. You're nothing. At this point, Rey has nothing. She is left to discover that her nightmare has come true, her want to be a part of some great family to define her identity for her is lost. I'm starting to think it isn't possible to hear the voices of the Jedi who came before. She likely entered a Great Depression in the years we didn't see her, and upon meeting her once again, she is comforted, despite clear bemusement by the very idea of being truly alone. You're the best fighter we have. We need you. Out there, not here. Junior. Rey has less internal confliction than other characters, but all that's required for growth is a few moments where she second guesses her instincts before acting. Right. You're mine. 
It's the Death Star. It's a bad place. The only family you have here is me. It's subtle and unspoken, but the sense that she is conflicted about doing something that she knows Leia would disapprove of is palpable. Now, Finn is much more complex. He's got a lot of plot-oriented goals, things like getting Rey to dissuade her destiny and connect with her family that she's found along the way, or appealing to Ben Solo directly. But what he actually wants on a character level is external validation. He wants to hear that his decisions are important, therefore so is he. His actions are directly reticent to the institution he is a part of. On screen, the villainous characters are constantly espousing that he must behave in framing that has been crafted by the very institution he was trying to run from. Traitor! That's how we're gonna win. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. These were blatant representations of roadblocks we all face in real life. They prevent our true nature from fighting our own cause, but for the purposes of this analysis, this is his want. Because wants are things you have trouble resisting. Where's Ray? I'm just here to get Ray. But this fleet is doomed, and if my friend comes back to it, she's doomed too. A spy. Who? <laughs> People believe in Leia. What he needs is to become emotionally independent, to carve out his own institution, his own identity. But Poe seems to be the character whose arc is least appreciated. And I think it's because we sort of expected him to start the movie as the person he only transforms into at the end of the movie. That sounds a little confusing, but consider this. Poe and Han feel like completely different characters personality-wise, but in each of their first films, they have similar arcs. Neither of them care about the politics of the galaxy at all, and just want to look after themselves as they perform what they see as heroic acts. Only later do they do something selfless. Han saves the galaxy by saving Luke, and Poe saves the galaxy by saving Finn. At the beginning of The Empire Strikes Back, Han is now not just a good friend, but a loyal soldier in the fight against the Empire. So I think we sort of expected that Poe would be one too. But Ryan Johnson's insight into the character is in acknowledging that Poe hasn't yet made that step, and that he could tell a whole story about Poe's identity through radicalization into the ideological battle of the Resistance. At the end of The Force Awakens, Poe acted to save a friend. So at the beginning of this movie, that is now his want, to save a friend. Falcon's all up in a shape that he is. bb not on fire. What's the left of him isn't on fire. Tell me what happened. You tell me first. His need is to become concerned not just with the safety of his friends, but of the galaxy as a whole. He needs to become a rebel. And this is why the hatred of Rose needs to stop. Her actions, though negative, push these characters through their journeys. Part 2, Conflict. Adolf Wolf Dukovsky is a Russian philosopher I very much admire. And he said, The fundamental equation of storytelling is to distinguish what challenges the want versus satisfying the need. Once you discover the difference, nothing stands in your way. And so, how do the characters' wants and needs conflict with the outside world? How do they conflict with other characters? The outside world one is pretty easy, right? They all conflict with the First Order, and Poe conflicts with the lower classes of Kajimi. But as to the second question, each of the main characters is opposed by two others. One who represents or enables their wants, and one which forces them to realize what they need. The protagonist is sort of caught in a tug of war between these two opponents. Poe is in conflict with Finn because of his recklessness, but he doesn't force him to change his ways. He scolds him, but enables him as well. How do you know how to do that? On the other hand, Finn freezes him out of a leadership position entirely, and shows zero tolerance for his attitude. Well, I'm not Leia. That's for damn sure. As for Rey, Kylo keeps impressing on her that she has a moral responsibility to search out her identity. You need a teacher! I could show you the ways of the Force! Let the past die. Kill it. 
if you have to. That's the only way to become what you were meant to be. I'm going to find you, and I'm going to turn you to the dark side. You're so lonely. I'm so afraid to leave. I know when the moment comes, you'll be the one to turn. You'll stand with me. Join me. While Luke argues that there is no objective morality and that Rey would be wise to be more identified within herself. She still trained me. Because she saw your spirit. Your heart. The detour through Kojimi, which, hey, hey, I know it admittedly has some pacing issues, but is perfect on a thematic level. It's the splash of water in the face that wakes Rey up to what she needs to do. And finally, there is Finn, who, though he is briefly in conflict with Snoke, spends most of the film in opposition to Janna and her ex-trooper antagonists, one of whom warns him about the dangers of following his selfish identitarian desires, seeking a faction to define him rather than being a faction he is desperate to support, as these heroes have become. Janna is Finn's character brought to absolution. So, by the way, if you're wondering why Chewbacca or Nimnub or Zori Bliss or whoever wasn't in this movie more, this is why. These ten characters encompass the entirety of the moral framework of the story. Everyone else is a prop, a plot pusher, or a meme. Part 3. Change. Our final questions are essentially, how does this character change and what impact does that change have on everyone else? Well, they all do what they need to do. Finn confronts his need for identity in the trilogy by being dominated through institution. He chooses to abandon one only to listen to awful influences in his life adopting another, setting him up to realize his failure and through the completion of his arc, he accepts that the institution he needed was in himself the whole time. That's how we're gonna win. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. Go without us. We're taking this entire ship down. What? As Rose's sophistry is debunked, Finn realizes it was there all along. He didn't need to join any institution to become a better man to discover his identity. Rey has been searching for a concrete identity, only to now be free of the chains of unimportance, nothingness, and villainy. Her need was to craft her own identity and become the woman she always was, a Skywalker. Poe has three conflicting identities sourced directly from how others see him. Throughout the trilogy, he is the heroic rogue, the reckless glory seeker, and the drug-dealing degenerate. It. His need is not to choose one of these identities, but to own the truth. He is all three, the rogue, glory-seeking, reckless, drug-dealing, degenerate hero. And only in accepting that he can both symbolically and literally replace Princess Leia as commander of the Resistance forces. Kylo Ren begins the trilogy with a want as a dark shadow of Vader. And I will finish. What you started. Only to become a cowardly failure in The Last Jedi. And upon realizing his identity was in direct conflict with Palpatine, he was adamant despite sexual confusion that he could own the identity this entire trilogy wanted for him. Benjamin Solo Organa. The hero that the meta-identity for Star Wars needed. A perfect combination of old and new, breathing the literal life into the future as it passes into legend. It was incredible. And as I said, this theme applies to the sub-villains. Hux grapples with his former want being a white supremacist youth, and he comes to realize that racism is not a viable pathway, forcing him to become a hero by releasing the protagonist person of color. His need for identity overcame his need to hurt black people. And if you have a problem with this, then I don't care. 
Having Nazis unsubscribe from my channel is one of the best feelings on this platform. Fuck Trump. An important note is that Finn grows through his conflict with Finn, and his actions provide an opportunity for Finn to enter into his inner identity crisis. Kylo's descent into villainy pushes Rey into an identitarianism that forces her to act. She rescues the remaining Skywalkers from the shame and disgust that Luke brought upon the family name. This is capitalism corrupting identity. And to address many of the angry fans being unhappy with the Rey Palpatine reveal, I think you need to understand that this was exactly where Ryan's story was heading. The issue is that many fans had irrational preconceived notions of who Rey was and they couldn't understand the idea that this is who she actually was from the beginning. Ray never belonged to anyone, and to act that way is childish. That's what this story is trying to tell you. Subverting expectations is something that J.J. Abrams has always been a master at. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Can you help me? Yes. He uses it to tell us that the world is uncertain of the pains and pleasures we experience. Similarly, Kylo had grown in The Last Jedi only to flounder in the final scenes. His veneer was cracking. So naturally, he reforged the helmet to represent his attempt at getting back to what he knew, supporting Ryan Johnson's ideas directly. When Kylo is forced to be defined by his immature nature or to become a hero that Rey always saw and loved within him, he once again destroys the mask. It's masterful and it's foreshadowed thoroughly. Rey's lightsaber being broken represented the schism between light and dark, between her lineage and her nature. The repairs made to the lightsaber represent the wonderful scene at the end of The Last Jedi in which Leia tells her that even though the blade is in two pieces, it's all they need in order to begin anew. We have everything we need. The rise of Skywalker subverts everything we understand about power and the acidic nature of shadows in identity. Each character isn't isolated, each plotline affects the others, especially when the characters fail. And in answering all of the questions for each character in the foundation of storytelling, the rise of Skywalker tells complete narratives. And not just for these three characters, but for Luke, Hux, Pride, Neum Nub, Goron Bisk, and Kylo Ren. That's more dynamic characters, as in more characters who undergo a change more meaningful and significant than in any other Star Wars media. But nothing I said so far is an argument for the film being great, even though I personally think it is. Those are arguments for the rise of Skywalker being competent, for it having a rock-solid dramatic foundation. It's an argument for its strength in quality, its greatness. And you have to acknowledge that even if the movie made you angry, despite being fictional and being intended for children. The rise of Skywalker should be applauded for resisting the temptation to indulge its audience with fan service, callbacks, and references. For telling a real story that questions the themes and ideas of the previous films instead of just pandering to us. It took Ryan Johnson's master piece and moved every last idea of his forward just like he did with JJ in the first place. Luke needed to be punished for his mistakes. Rose needed recognition as a destructive influence. Kylo needed to fall in love. Holdo's maneuver was cowardice. Rey needed identity. Finn needed to sacrifice himself once again. And Poe needed to be reckless once again. But most of all, our characters and 
and this saga needed identity. This trilogy was perhaps the most intensive and bold thematic undercurrent of the modern age of cinematic filmmaking language. J.J. Abrams looked at Ryan Johnson's incredibly detailed and honest understanding of the human experience and he asked the question, what if? only to answer that question in not just the most meaningful Star Wars film, but the most incredible in terms of action, pacing, legitimate theming, lighting, real cinematography, specialized effects, screenplay nuance, and acting. Taking one last look, sir. The Rise of Skywalker may not be the film you wanted, but it is the movie this franchise and its audience needed. And that is how to achieve an exploration in identity. Thank you for learning how to write stories with me, and if you disagree, remember that everyone has the right to an opinion. But to spread videos online that hate and are spiteful toward the people who work really hard on these projects? Well, I think that's sad, and you're taking joy out of the world. I'll see you next episode, folks. Raid Shadow Legends. On the other hand, Finn freezes him out of a leadership position. 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 The fuck?